I'm Stuart Patrick, and this is The World Unpacked. Hey there, I'm your new interim host, Stuart Patrick. I'm really excited to be hosting The World Unpacked on a monthly basis until we get back up to speed. This week, delegates from around the world have descended on the Red Sea Resort of Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt for COP27. It's the world's latest effort to bend the curve on climate change. In the past year alone, historic floods have inundated Pakistan and Nigeria. Hurricanes have battered Florida and the Caribbean, while Europe has suffered its worst droughts in 500 years. And scientists are telling us this is only the beginning. To complicate matters, this climate crisis isn't unfolding in isolation. It's doing so against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine, U.S.-China frictions, energy and food insecurity, surging inflation and mounting debt, and supply chain disruptions, not to mention the aftermath of a historic pandemic. In other words, the diplomats in Egypt have their work cut out for them. They need to broker a deal that considers climate, geopolitics, and energy all at once, issues on which the world's east and west, as well as its north and south, don't always see eye to eye. Fortunately, we've got somebody on the ground who can make sense of it all. With me for my first show is Dan Baer. Dan's the Senior Vice President for Policy Research at Carnegie. He also happens to be my boss. Dan's in Egypt, along with our Carnegie colleagues, Zainab Uzman, Emmer Hamzawi, and Olivia Lazard. We'll unpack what's happening in Egypt and the state of climate action. So let's dive right in. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Okay. So, uh, Dan, you're in Charm for uh, COP27. What's the atmosphere like? Uh, is the mood there hopeful or pessimistic? You know, there's a lot of moods here because it's... Um, it, it, I was trying to think about how to describe for people who haven't attended a COP what it's like. And I guess I'm kind of lucky in that I'm here for the first time. This is my first time at a COP. I've been to other multilateral conferences around topics like the internet or security issues, et cetera. And there's some familiar aspects to it because there's kind of a main room where the government representatives make their formal speeches. But then there's a lot of other spaces around where there are side events hosted by some by governments, by international organizations, by civil society organizations. And so it's it's kind of a multi-ring circus. And the mood varies by the room that you're in. Um, I, I think one of the things that seems clear to me is that, well, uh, I guess before coming here, I expected to see much more diplomatic negotiation going on. I was talking to somebody who's come to COP, the last 20 COPs, uh, and they said that, you know, what's changed is really that what COP is today is a signaling mechanism and that the, the real political change has to be driven. The deal has been struck at Paris in terms of the, the broad f framework for how governments are going to approach this. And the real political energy is going to have to come from the bottom up in countries around the world. This is this is a place where you can signal where progress should head, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily drive the the enforceable deal that's going to that's going to make people take action. I guess what you're saying is that we should probably temper our expectations about uh, what any one particular event is going to accomplish. Obviously, you know, this is the culmination of a lot of negotiations that's been going on both uh, in public and behind the scenes. Uh, quick question, you know, at normal cops, uh, for instance, in Glasgow last year, there's a whole lot of civil society activism, a lot of a lot of you know protests, a lot of a lot of folks uh, on the streets, you know, demanding that uh, that world leaders take action. Streets, and we must keep demanding our leaders to take real climate action. We must never give up. There's no going back now. How does that unfold in a place like Egypt, which is obviously an authoritarian country uh, under a pretty heavy handed ruler? Uh, are, are you seeing a uh, civil society presence there in in sort of any, you know, even quasi antagonistic sense towards uh, towards this process? You know, um, there th there's definitely a civil society presence in terms of participation at the COP. And there are there are, um, I would say, peaceful protests of of small scale going on within the, the COP environment environment, which means with people who have badges to get into the conference. There were some people outside of the the conference at the entrance, um, nothing too overwhelming. And I didn't see much evidence of Egyptian civil society um, being present. Uh, and probably for the reasons you mentioned, not only the political climate here, but the fact that it's being held at a, you know, remote, a relatively remote resort town, uh, not in central Cairo or something like that. The, interestingly though, um, there was the sister 
of Allah Abdel, Abdel Fattah, who has been imprisoned here, uh, came to COP yesterday and gave a press conference. And for some reason that is um, that is hard for me to imagine the thinking behind, uh, a the the government apparently sent a pro government MP to disrupt that press conference. And he had to be removed forcibly by UN security. You can imagine that that incident only backfired uh, in that it focused a lot of attention uh, on her and and her brother's case, uh, and so a lot of people have been talking about it. So uh, I think um, probably Egypt was hoping that there would be little focus on human rights at this at this COP, um, but they ended up creating an incident that has really sh- shined a spotlight. Let's rewind a little bit and talk about what some of the big um, sort of benchmarks uh, of uh, how to judge uh, whether or not this this is going to be a success or not are. Um, let's talk mitigation first. Um, a main goal of climate action, which uh, this conference is all about, is lowering how to lower greenhouse gas emissions to prevent uh, global temperatures from rising to uh, two degrees uh, Celsius above pre-industrial times, or and ideally to no more than one point five degrees Celsius, and, and these are these are targets that were set in Paris back in 2015. Are we on track to meet uh, either of those targets? Well, the IPCC came out uh, a few weeks ago and announced that there are no remaining viable pathways to limiting temperature rise to one point five. Um, this didn't come as a surprise to anybody who's been reading the science, but it. Um, even when you know something's coming, uh, like an election, even when you know you're going to lose an election, it still stings uh, when it finally comes true. So, um, you know, that is, uh, on the one hand, depressing, on the other hand, a wake up call, because we know that even with 1.5 degrees of warming, there will be disastrous effects on millions of lives around the world. There are already effects happening on millions of lives around the world. And so the urgency of of taking action to to limit warming uh, as much as we can. Uh, I've heard people talking about 1.8, even though two is the kind of normal ne- next threshold. I don't think people are ready to give up on something between 1.5 and two, which is interesting as people adjust to to the moved goalposts. Um, but you know we're not on track for the 1.5 anymore. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, UN Secretary General uh, has been uh, quite. Uh... You know, uh, scathing about the the failures of the international community to come together, uh, particularly the major emitters. Uh, he's saying we're on the highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Uh, so when you when you look at some of the big emitters, uh, let's let's take the sort of the four big emitters. You've got China, obviously, the United States, the European Union, and India. Um, would you say that you know some of those are bigger culprits than others, or are there leaders or laggards in terms of how they're actually performing? Do you have a do you have a sense of if you were going to give a report card to uh, some of the, the some of the biggest players in terms of emissions? Uh, uh, how, how would you see things? I mean, I think the report card question is a good one. I think different different uh, vantage points would produce different report cards, certainly different composites for each of those actors. What is clear is that all of them will be essential to uh, mitigation and that there will be no path to uh, saving the world from the most, from as much of the disaster as we can. That doesn't include all of those actors, as well as several others, um, so several other major actors. I, I did see, you know, John Podesta, who's been advising President Biden uh, with the, with China's uh, climate uh, represent, uh, ambassador yesterday speaking together on a panel about methane and methane containment. Uh, John Podesta pointed out that, you know, half a degree of the 1.2 degrees that we've warmed so far is attributable to methane, and yet only 2% of mitigation and investments are spent on methane. And so there's a real disjunct between cause causes of current warming or the cause of warming so far and, and where we're spending money. Um, you know, there was a I would say constructive conversation between uh, China, the Chinese, and the American representative in that in that room. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of China's presence at this. I've been that's one of the things that I, has struck me is that I haven't seen a strong Chinese presence at this COP. Uh, but certainly, India is here. Uh, the European Union is, and, as well as uh, European Union member states, are all uh, very active here on the ground in Sharm. And the U.S. Uh, delegation is uh, is very large. Secretary, uh, former Secretary Kerry, current. Special Presidential Envoy is here for the full two weeks, as well as a number of assistant secretaries and other cabinet officials, et cetera. So it's it's a uh, it's a full press from the, the U.S. side uh, as well, and and some major announcements being made. 
as the uh, 1.5 degree target moves further out of reach uh, and the planet heads for uh, what some have been calling sort of climate overshoot, uh, you know, well above two degrees uh, Celsius, uh, do you see the world's sort of beginning to throw in the towel on mitigation and focusing more on adaptation? You know, for the longest time, uh, the, the, the focus of these uh, COPs has really been on uh, trying to keep emissions down. But you, I wondered with, uh, with the release of the UN report that you referenced, whether or not uh, people have said, look, the, 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 real, the real attention, the real focus of uh, collective effort globally is going to have to shift towards uh, adaptation uh, and, uh, and we're going to use our limited resources on that. Do you see evidence of that? I don't really. I mean, in the sense that I, I think people are continuing to have both conversations. I think there's a very clear recognition that the problem is no longer technical in the sense that uh, we know, broadly speaking, what needs to be done. It is political and because it's political and it is political because it's also economic. Obviously, we do need to invest massive amounts of resources. And that's always going to create a political challenge, especially with the collective action problem. And so on both the mitigation and the adaptation side, um, there is a political challenge with figuring out who's going to take the lead and who's going to pay for it. Um, and obviously you've seen, you know, one of the things that I think will be a news story coming out of uh, this particular COP, even though it won't be, you know, on the order of uh, Copenhagen or Paris in terms of being these giant steps forward. One of the things that will come out of this particular COP is that the topic of loss and damage, that is to say the kind of climate speak for reparations uh, from less developed countries that are that have uh, emit, are responsible for le a lower portion of the emissions that have created warming so far and are already experiencing damages from it, are they have gotten, they have successfully negotiated to get loss and damage as a topic on the agenda, which it never has been before. And that is seen as a major step forward in opening that conversation. So you have not only the mitigation and adaptation, but you have a kind of justice uh, conversation that is going on as well here. Yeah, let's delve into that a little bit more. Yeah, because that is fascinating. It seemed it seemed that uh, that this was uh, th you know there was a chance at the beginning of the COP. It seemed as if you know you might even get a walkout from a lot of countries of the global south. Uh, obviously, many of them extraordinarily um, vulnerable to climate change and its consequences. Already facing uh, some of, some of uh, extreme weather events and uh, and really. Uh, the question of whether or not certain parts of those those countries are actually going to be livable anymore, and yet you know a, a an entire continent like Africa only responsible for three percent of historic uh, emissions. So uh, this question of uh, of, of uh, you know what what are the arguments uh, that are that development countries are actually making in terms of reparations? Because one one assumes that the devil's in the details, right? How do you calculate that? What does it cover? And how are rich countries um, actually responding to uh, some of these things? Is is there a prospect, in, in a sense, for some sort of grand bargain on this? Uh, because up until recently, of course, you know, the wealthy world has basically been ignoring this for a number of different reasons. Partly because they think it might be, you know, uh, they they might be held accountable in in sort of some sort of legal process if they actually accept the language of uh, of loss and damage. Uh, do do you see uh, sort of uh, the ice shifting, in a, in a sense, uh, breaking up a little bit uh, between uh, in terms of the diplomatic uh, space for actually coming to agree an agreement on loss and damage? You know, I think it's too soon to say that. I, I think um, it is helpful to think about two components to the loss and damage uh, conversation. Uh, one one is a, a kind of responsibility argument in the moral sense, um, a taking ownership of a, a problem uh, or one's role in a problem. And the other is a financial argument that there should be some damages that 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 attach to that. Um, and I, I guess I should say, with with the responsibility piece, there's also an acknowledgement of the loss that has been incurred, the, the the damage that has already been done. There's an acknowledgement of of the damage that is being done today. And and I think that I do think that you know because we are at a point where there's a political problem, I think there is potentially space for a uh, a productive, constructive conversation between, uh, broadly speaking, the global north and the global south, where the global north can acknowledge both the the um, current and and future damage that will be inflicted on the global south uh, because of climate change, uh, and the fact that the global north has played an outsized role in, in the emissions so far. Um, 
without necessarily um, expending the financial resources or the bulk of the financial resources that are at play to invest in an energy transition and to adaptation uh, in that conversation. And I think there's a moral step forward that could be taken to help facilitate the political conversation that has to address the immediate and medium term mitigation and adaptation needs of the world. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So it seems like there's at least some movement um, towards, um, you know, willingness on the part of the, of the global north uh, to uh, accept um uh, the the need to include yeah, you, you alluded to the need to include uh, this as an agenda item and as and as something that needs to be negotiated going forward. We urge our partners in the global north to step up their climate finance to the global south. Team Europe is providing its fair share of the one hundred billion dollar promise. For the you know, from the perspective of um, countries in the global south, I could imagine a, a significant degree of skepticism given the uh, failure of, uh, you know, the wealthy world to deliver over the past 13 years since it was promised in 2009 to come up with $100 billion a year simply for the clean energy transition and, uh, and adaptation needs of uh, some of these countries. So, you know, the, uh, my, do you have a sense of is anybody talking about what the magnitude of something like this might look like uh, in terms of uh, loss and damage and whether or not – are there worries that would, it would detract from the other source of funding that uh, developing countries are going to need to, to, uh, to uh, you know, basically decarbonize uh, uh, and meet their own needs? I don't think there's any question that the key leaders in the – say the G7 who are going to be needed, the G7 plus the EU, who are going to be needed to – uh, both mobilize private capital, provide support to uh, international institutions, and to provide uh, their own investments in the global south in order to facilitate uh, desperately needed adaptation and mitigation measures, are going to be unwilling to have a serious conversation about large-scale uh, funds being allocated to loss and damage claims in the near future. I, I, I don't see that happening. Like I said, I think there could be a moral conversation that started and, you know, things can evolve over time. I, I could be proven wrong. But I think there is one of the things that has shifted uh, in talking to people and asking the question, what's different about this cop from a cop 10 years ago or 15 years ago? One of the things that has shifted is that uh, before it was about science and urgency. And now a lot of the conversations going on around here are about money and implementation. And that means that where before you had, you know, the climate ambassador or the minister of uh, ecology or the minister of environment from a number of countries, you now have the finance ministries and the minister responsible for infrastructure uh, here at COP having conversations. And and to me, that's a good sign that you're not that the conversations weren't important before, but that we've moved to a point where people are talking about what is the plan for actually transitioning the energy uh, system in country X. How much is it going to cost? What kind of private sector inv involvement is there going to be? What kind of uh, concessional financing might be needed in order to catalyze that? Um, people are people are talking about concrete plans to make that energy transition, not just the urgency of doing so. And I think there will continue to be a focus on that part of the conversation here and then next year in the UAE at the next COP as well. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, one of the promising developments is the, the movement from simply having some of these discussions discussed by environment uh, ministries and now moving more into the center of, uh, of the economics and finance ministries in countries. And then, of course, uh, uh, the increased uh, salience of this uh, uh, amongst, uh, you know, foreign ministers and, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the U.S. Department of State uh, on these matters. Uh, and, and on that note, we're, we're going to be right back uh, to talk about the war in Ukraine and how tensions with China have affected climate change diplomacy and where the U.S. itself stands on climate action today. Hey, World Unpacked fans. Thanks for listening to the show. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and leave us a review to help us out. Better yet, let all your friends and colleagues at the State Department and Ministry of Foreign Affairs or just your next dinner companion know that they should be listening to The World Unpacked too. Now let's get back to it. So, Dan, obviously the war in Ukraine has dominated international headlines since February. Uh, how in your mind has the Russian invasion and the geopolitical and economic fallout from that changed uh, prospects for global climate action? You know, what's the diplomatic landscape 
how, how has it been overturned or, uh, and made more turbulent by, by this over the past year? Well, there, it's obviously had a number of uh, near and medium term effects on, on energy supplies, particularly in Europe, um, which obviously, given that markets are global, ha- has a knock on effect uh, on the world. I think in terms of the conversation going on at COP, there's probably two uh, bigger picture implications or places where the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine has that had an effect. One is on food security, just because um, the war has, uh, because of Russian active uh, attempts to hold in Ukraine's grain harvest and uh, the importance of Ukraine as an exporter of food, uh, the war has highlighted uh, food security as an issue, and food security is obviously also a climate issue, um, and therefore you see a bunch of conversations about food security going on. There are several pavilions here, which are the kind of spaces in which these side events take place uh, that are dedicated to food and agricultural systems, et cetera. And I think it's probably made those issues more salient in the conversations here. The other one, which is which is quite interesting, you know, this COP is the first one to take place uh, in Africa in, in a decade or so. And um, there, there is a concerted effort on, on the part of Egypt to, to make this what they've called the African COP. And one of the issues that African countries, several African countries have raised and put on the table is the importance of the importance they attach to gas as a transit as what they call a transitional fuel, uh, meaning transitional from from coal or or wood in some cases. And, you know, last year and and in recent years, uh, the Europeans and others have said that they aren't going to fund any more fossil fuel extraction. Uh, which would preclude uh, investments in gas projects. Obviously, the war in Ukraine has forced uh, the Europeans to also look for new sources for gas for themselves. Uh, and I think that's changed the conversation here and made and opened up something that uh, several African governments are very interested in, in, in talking about. And that would not have happened but for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, I think all of these just remind us that they're that the climate challenge is connected to the global system in a multitude of ways that you sometimes don't realize when you pull string A over here, how it's going to have an effect on string Z on the other side. And we we can see those play out after the fact in ways that we could have predicted, but we don't always do a good job of predicting how those things are going to play out. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and and I, I want to stick with that energy theme uh, for a minute um, because, you know, one of the big criticisms of climate diplomacy, particularly, you know, sort of wealthy countries telling uh, other countries that that, uh, that they shouldn't invest in uh, in fossil fuels, um, uh, at least until uh, the, 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 those wealthy countries actually find that the going gets tough, and then they start doing the same thing, uh, as you pointed out during the Ukraine invasion. But it's it's it really sticks in the craw of a lot of uh, developing countries, and not least in Africa, um, because you have this dilemma of the competing demands of development on the one hand, and then of decarbonization. Um, you know these these countries, uh, many of them, as as you point out, acutely vulnerable to climate change and, and its impacts. But they also need energy access uh, uh, to reduce poverty and meet basic human needs. And I believe uh, our colleague uh, Zainab Usman uh, sort of, uh, cited the figure that nearly a billion people around the uh, the world, perhaps half a billion in Africa itself, lack reliable access to energy, and billions more, of course, rely on coal for their main energy source. So. You know, it's welcome that there might be a, a a a bigger conversation about you know how to balance uh, energy needs uh, that are associated with development uh, with with climate action. But but how do you square that circle uh, uh, if you you know if, if there's going to be a little bit of a doubling down of fossil fuels, not only uh, in sub European countries as you point out, but then you know, countries turning towards natural gas, even to some degree holding on to coal uh, longer, uh, doesn't that create, sort of reinforce the, 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 the mitigation problem that we started with? I suppose it does, although I think there's a, there's a real, um, there's an ongoing and serious effort to look at the economics of the energy transition, including in less developed countries, and also to the trade-offs. Obviously, there are also trade-offs to not decarbonizing their their economies, um, health trade-offs. There are economic development trade-offs. So it's not like the existing energy sources. Uh, obviously, the existing energy system is not meeting the needs of of 
hundreds of millions of people. And so if a new energy system could, it would both decarbonize and also enhance development by providing and, and, and human welfare, presumably by providing energy to more people. Uh, I was at a session that the World Bank led today uh, at, at their pavilion where uh, the speakers highlighted the fact that for less developed countries, the the failure to decarbonize, sorry, the failure to take action on climate change threatens to have a 12% impact on uh, on on some of these uh, less developed countries' GDP in the next uh, 20 to 30 years, whereas the decarbonization of their energy uh, has a very a very small effect, and it, it can be out um, it, it's marginally positive or marginally negative, and the investments needed to do that can be supported from outside. And so it is possible for them to continue to grow and and stay on a development path while also decarbonizing at the same time. And I think, you know, th those those plans will vary country by country. But I think part of solving the political challenge is to make clear that what we're not asking countries to do is to trade off the welfare of their citizens for a decarbonization agenda when the welfare of their citizens does not uh, meet um, you know, when, when their citizens aren't comfortably above a certain standard of living already. There are going to be trade-offs, obviously, in some countries because the, because of the level of resources that are required, not permanent trade-offs, because there will be benefits to developing the green economy and there will be new technologies that have broader applications and should make things both more green and more efficient or more productive at the same time. But there's going to need to be some subsidization of that initial investment to, to green, less developed countries' uh, energy systems and, and help them also continue to develop. You know, another key ingredient to getting to decarbonization and uh, to, uh, to the, bat the reversing uh, or at least halting climate change is going to be uh, cooperation between the two biggest emitters. Uh, obviously, that's China, which is responsible for nearly 30 percent of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and then the United States. Uh, but it seems to me that um, climate cooperation between these two superpowers has basically collapsed. Uh, you know, the Chinese themselves has linked uh, cooperation on this agenda to, you know, more tractable U.S. positions on Taiwan or the treatment of the Uyghur min minority in Xinjiang province and other issues. Uh, John Kerry, the U.S. climate envoy, has, has said, look, we're not going to allow uh, or treat the existential threat of climate change uh, as a bargaining chip. The world needs to see these two powerful countries actually working together. And uh, there is no bigger threat, frankly, on the planet right now than the climate crisis and the ways we are seeing every single day around the world. Glaciers. But the Chinese don't seem to be so circumspect. Um, is there any hope, do you think, of restarting collaboration between the world's two largest emitters when they are, you know, engaged in sort of a proto-Cold War uh, where – you know, some of that strategic rivalry ends up spilling over into areas uh, that are of common interest, like uh, preventing uh, uh, climate change from getting so out of hand that it makes life on the planet uh, uh, really, really hard to imagine. You know, I guess I take a slightly unconventional view on this. I, I know that there's great concern about the implications of the U.S.-China uh, competitive relationship, or however you want to characterize it today, uh, as as being a threat um, to global climate action, and I, I suppose it can be. And, and sure, I mean, if if it, if China was a democracy, I suppose there would be much more that the two countries could do together. But I don't. I think actually looking for cooperation between the U.S. and China on climate was always looking for something that was unlikely to materialize. There isn't genuine cooperation on much uh, it, with the Chinese between the United States and China. Uh, not genuine cooperation in the sense of like shared interests and values guiding a long-term relationship that is not transactional and that is truly relational. Th there is coordination and there can continue to be coordination. And I think the Chinese will take action on climate for their own reasons, um, including the fact that they see a comparative, a potential competitive advantage to being a leader on the green energy transition, both economically and reputationally in the world. And sorry, the green energy transition. And, and you know, so I think they will take action for their own reasons. It will be good if we can be, uh, if we can avoid inefficiencies in, in where we invest resources and the steps we take. And so I hope that they will not cut off their nose despite their face in terms of failing to 
coordinate where the U.S. is clearly reaching out and trying to do that on this front. Um, but I, I, I don't think we ever were. It was never the case that China was going to take action on climate because it was trying to please the United States of America or the European Union. They were always going to take action on climate because they deem it in their national interest. Right. So the, it, what you're suggesting, it sounds like, is that the parallel pursuit of a national interest on the part of both the United States and China uh, can and even even perhaps their their competition to see who can be uh, uh, the, the, the pioneer in, in the green uh, energy technologies and industries of tomorrow could actually uh, pay off uh, pay off uh, for the climate. Uh, I want to turn to the United States now, um, you know. Obviously, President Biden's going to be coming to Charm uh, this Friday. Uh, what do you think his goals going into COP uh, 27 will be? And uh, and what is his diplomatic credibility on that agenda? Um, in addition, last night, obviously, we uh, we held some uh, pretty pivotal midterm elections, uh, which were incredibly close, as you know. Uh, the Republicans may win a razor thin uh, House majority uh, and the Senate, though, remains up in the air. Um, how, what position do you think he comes into uh, here in, in uh, at COP27? And, and what do you think the stakes are in term, both at COP, but also in terms of the domestic political developments in the United States for U.S. climate policy? Well, I think certainly the elections this week will make uh, Biden, uh, w are, are helpful to Joe Biden in persuading the world of one thing, which is that um, that the climate policies that his administration has pursued over the last two years, which have been... Uh, uh, you know, in many ways, a 180 of the previous administration or uh, a continuation and a ramping up of of what uh, occurred under the Obama administration, a return to Paris, et cetera, that those that those will continue and will not be immediately endangered by, for instance, uh, Joe Biden being um, uh, plausibly, you know, uh, impeached multiple times by a a strongly a strong house majority for republicans um and if if republicans won the senate having trials in the senate and stuff like that so i i think i think to the extent that the global community has and a, a number of them have raised the issue of how credible the united states is given that uh the united states negotiated at paris and then and then walked and then pulled out of the paris agreement how credible the united states is i think Joe Biden can at least say, look, I, I got a pretty strong outcome, all things considered, uh, which included voters voting after we passed the largest, the most significant investment in, in climate uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation measures in the United States that has that has ever been passed, that is also the world's largest single investment. And so I think he has a good message to tell people about the kind of strength of his commitment and, the, and his own confidence and his ability to continue to lead on this. I think that there will continue to be demands that the United States and other actors do more. And and, and I think probably Joe Biden will do, uh, will make an attempt to demonstrate uh, the United States commitment to continue to lead in this area, to ramp up leadership. You know, um, he will attempt to, to play the role, I've called it in other contexts, of the cooperator in chief uh, for the world on, on this urgent issue. It's clear that he is seized of it, uh, and there's a large U.S. delegation here pushing the, uh, the issue on the ground. Well, let's, let's close maybe with uh, your prognosis. Uh, we're almost halfway through COP27. Uh, there's still a lot to be done in the next week of the conference, of course. What do you think success would look like? Is it is it an agreement on loss and damage? Is it new emissions pledges, uh, more adaptation finance, uh, all of the above, or something else? I mean, I guess one measure of success would be, um, you know, at Glasgow, uh, countries agreed to update their uh, nationally developed plans for meeting their their Paris commitments, uh, and uh, relatively few countries followed through on that. And and so one measure of success would be that there's a recommitment to to do that. I think one of the things that I'm taking away from this is how important um, those plans are at every level. Uh, you know, obviously, these each country has to have a plan for how they're going to meet their commitments. But we also need um, enormous amounts of data and planning to be able to implement those plans, including the plans to support other countries um, where where there is a requirement for investment from the global north and the global south. It's not like you can just, you know, put a hundred million dollars in the mail and then suddenly transform a country's 
electricity grid. There there has to be engineering and and all kinds of planning and and phases and and engagement with local communities to to discuss the implications and where they're going to and, and, and intersections with investment plans and where economic development is likely to occur in order to project, project future demand and all the rest of that. And that's all preconditioned for that and those things being investment ready and certainly preconditioned for uh, for private capital being willing to come in. And so I, I think um, if there were at least the, the national governments committing to establish their plans, that would kind of hopefully have a, a, a knock on effect of causing others to also jumpstart planning so that there could be this this shift towards implementation. And I think we'll see broadly a continuation of this conversation next year uh, in the UAE at the next COP. Yeah, one thing you're really um, driving home is that the battle against climate change is the greatest collective action uh, problem that humanity has ever tried to tackle. And it's going to—it's really, it's from the sounds of it, it's going to require and continue to require a root and branch transformation of uh, the political economies or the, the economies of all UN member states, particularly the largest ones. And uh, and 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 uh, an incredible partnership between um, governments, um, private corporations, including uh, the financial sector, and obviously local communities. I just want to pick up on your 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 point there. It, it is the largest collection uh, action problem of all time, and there's re there's a bunch of reasons to feel pessimistic about that because collection act collective action problems become their hardest at precisely the moment that they become most urgent because people start feeling the pinch themselves and there's a natural tendency to look out only for yourself and and not think about the collective action problem and so there's a there's there is a um, an understandable sense of kind of please don't let this all fall apart or or maybe even um you know forecasting a, a bit of dread about our, our prospects on the other hand i heard a positive spin uh or a positive version of what's happened so far last night talking to somebody who said look we've already done something enormous here, which is this is the largest uh, diplomatic international coordinated process that has ever existed where where countries all looked at the science and said, yes, the science says this is an urgent problem that faces all of us, and we are going to come together and agree to move forward together, and we're not going to move forward until we agree how we're going to move forward, and that's an enormous accomplishment. And so I think it's important to keep in, in perspective both the enormity of the challenge and the fact that it's likely to get harder, actually, as it becomes more urgent, but also the fact that like a lot has been accomplished so far. More than ever in human history, the world is on the same page with the urgency of this problem, and that is a good place to start from. You know, I got to say that that is a dose of optimism uh, that leaves me uh, feeling more hopeful than, I, than when I came in into this conversation. I think it's also one that... Uh, you know, people need to hold on to uh, as as the going, as you, as you suggest, uh, is going to get tougher before it gets easier. Um, Dan, I really th want to thank you for uh, being my first guest. Uh, good luck to you uh, and also to the rest of the crowd uh, assembled in Egypt as you help uh, try to chart a, a greener future for us, but uh, also a, a prosperous future and to balance those, uh, those goals. I really want to thank you again. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, thanks for listening to The World Unpacked, brought to you by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and please don't forget to rate and subscribe. The World Unpacked is produced by Cliff Jayapranata and Clarissa Guerrero and edited by our audio engineer, Tim Martin. Catch you next time.